The majority of U.S. Air Force fighter aircraft in service today are F-15s, F-16s, and A-10s acquired in the 1980s during that decade, the service had a fighter strength of approximately 36 fighter wing equivalents, with the average aircraft in the fleet about 10 years old since then the number of fielded fighters has steadily decreased, the Quadrennial Defense Review, QDR, of 2010 having established a requirement for 16 to 17 fighter wing equivalents additionally, the Air Force has acquired very Limited numbers of new fighters since the early 1990s, causing the fighter fleet's average age to increase steadily acquisition of the F-22 slowed but did not stop this trend this sustained decline in fighter inventory coincided with the development and acquisition of the F-22 originally, the Air Force intended to obtain 750 F-22s, primarily as replacements for air superiority F-15s acquired through the 1980s as late as 2008, Air Force Chief of Staff T. Michael Mosley stated that the service needed at least F-22s to meet operational requirements nonetheless, in 2009 Secretary of Defense Robert Gates announced that F-22 production would end at 187 in consideration of this decision. This article examines the F-22 program in an attempt to answer two questions. First, given the clear need to recapitalize its fleet, why did the Air Force acquire just 25% of the F-22s originally planned second? Could it have realized a better result by making alternative decisions during F-22 development? Finally, the article briefly addresses current fighter acquisition. Efforts in the context of the Air Force's experience with the F-22. History of the F-22 program. Originally, the Advanced Tactical Fighter, ATF, program sought to counter a Soviet threat during the Cold War. The ATF's mission air superior included finding and destroying high-priority enemy interceptors, standoff jammers, and large offensive attack formations plans did not call for air-to-ground attack, reconnaissance, or other multi-role missions advancements in Soviet weapons, especially the MiG-29 and Su-27 aircraft, during the 1980s heavily influenced the ATF's design developed about a decade after the F-15, these platforms possess similar aerodynamic performance although their avionics and long-range weapons remained inferior nonetheless. These Soviet advancements led Air Force leaders to believe that the F-15's decisive air superiority advantage was fading they wanted the ATF to preserve the technological advantage needed to battle superior Soviet numbers without incurring unacceptable losses. Seven companies presented proposals to the Air Force during the concept exploration phase. The service subsequently decided to incorporate a demonstration evaluation phase with two contractors competing in a flight test competition using full-scale prototypes, selecting Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman to lead the two teams in developing the YF-22 and YF-23, respectively in 1991 Secretary of the Air. Force Donald Rice announced that although both designs met requirements, the Lockheed Martin proposal was superior because it offered better capability at lower cost. The Air Force considered the Lockheed Martin Boeing General Dynamics team more likely to deliver on its promises than the Northrop McDonnell Douglas team, whose reputation was tarnished by B-2 problems and the A-12 cancellation. Thus, the ATF became the Lockheed Martin F-22. The demonstration evaluation phase transitioned to the Engineering, Manufacturing, and Development (EMD) phase in 1991 at that time, the Air Force forecast that the new fighter would reach initial operational capability, IOC, 10 years later in 2001 although the service intended to replace approximately 790 air superiority F-15s with F-22s, early post or Cold War cuts reduced planned production from 750 to 648 in 1991 at that time, it estimated the total cost of the program at $99.1 billion in then. Year dollars of that amount, $19.5 billion was dedicated to development, including $3.7 billion already spent during demonstration evaluation. The remaining $79.6 billion went to production, making the average production unit cost, APUC, $122.8 million. Early Engineering, Manufacturing, and Development In the early 1990s, the overall Department of Defense, DOD, budget came under increasing pressure in anticipation of a post-Cold War. Peace Dividend. By fiscal year, FY 1997, the DOD budget had decreased 38% from its FI 1985 peak while the procurement portion of the budget was simultaneously reduced by two-thirds, both figures in constant year dollars. The dwindling budget created an exceedingly difficult environment for F-22 development. The Air Force's post- Cold War sustainment strategy entailed sacrificing force structure and preserving modernization programs. Implementation of this strategy called for decreasing active duty manning by more than 40% from 602,582 to 351,375 personnel between FI 1987 and FI 2000 while the service aggressively 
Retired older tactical aircraft like the F-4, F-111, and a 7.16 consequently, by 1993 the Air Force's force structure had shrunk from 36 to 27 fighter wing equivalents, well ahead of the post-Cold War drawdown identified in the outgoing Bush administration's base force however, the new Clinton administration, determined to reduce the growing federal deficit, soon planned a second major restructuring of the military. The Air Force believed that simultaneously funding multiple development programs for tactical aircraft probably was not tenable. 18 Furthermore, senior Air Force leaders strongly supported the F-22-4. Example, Gen. Michael Lowe, commander of Tactical Air Command in the early 1990s and author of the original ATF Statement of Need in 1981, remained closely and continuously involved with the ATF program throughout his active duty career. Gen. Merrill McPeak, then the Air Force Chief of Staff, declared in 1994 that the F-22 is probably the single most important acquisition program in the entire Air Force after retiring. He continued to testify on the need to procure additional F-22s as a Result of this widespread support, other developmental programs such as the A, FX, a joint Air Force and Navy strike fighter, and the multi-role fighter, an F-16 replacement, were sacrificed for the F-22 during the bottom-up review BUR, negotiations the F-22 program survived, but the aircraft needed to do more under Secretary of Defense for acquisition John Deutsch was initially undecided on the F-22 he advocated that the initial operational aircraft incorporate an air-to-ground strike capability enabling the F-22 to eventually replace the F-117 in response. The Air Force moved to broaden the F-22's capabilities by formalizing limited air-to-ground strike capability under consideration for some time the modified F-22 design carried two 1,000-pound joint direct attack munitions, JDAM, guided by the Global Positioning System and its internal weapon base Lockheed Martin. Incorporated this add-on capability for the relatively modest sum of $6.5 million for the first time, the Air Force had modified the F-22's design to incorporate an additional capability other than air to air the BUR, released in 1993, further reduced the Air Force's fighter strength to 20 fighter wing equivalents. 24 planned F-22 production also decreased to 442 jets, a roughly proportional cut consistent with the new, smaller force structure although disappointed, the Air Force was relieved that the F-22's projected IOC date did not slip further beyond 2003. Since 1991 it had already slipped two years. What is the threat? Throughout its history, the primary criticism directed against the F-22 program was that the post-Cold War threat environment did not justify its cost. The 1993 BUR identified the DOD's responsibilities after the Cold War deter major regional conflict, maintain overseas presence, conduct small-scale intervention operations, and prevent attacks involving weapons of mass destruction Air Force senior leaders continued. To focus on advanced airborne threats of the future they believe that although Russia was less likely to present a direct threat to America, its advanced aircraft, or even Western developmental programs, such as the French Rafale, still justified continuation of the F-22 program. Additionally, General McPeak established a commitment to stealth that strongly influenced the Air Force's acquisition policy for the next 20 years as we field combat air forces for the future. Stealth and precision must be first-order requirements His testimony to Congress provided the most plausible F-22 justification, arguing that the F-15CS replacement must preserve the ability to operate over enemy territory if we want to defend United States airspace, the F-15 will work fine but I do not know where we are going to have to go in the year 2010 and have this fight what I do know is I want to fight over his guys not over my guys and that is what air superiority means to us, and that is really why we need the F-22-inch, emphasis in original, however, General McPeak also argued that we needed the F-22 for lower threat environments, noting that Bosnian air operations also justified the aircraft even though pilots. Threats there the Air Force's support for the F-22 remained consistent and unified, but others were not convinced in December 1993, the General Accounting Office, JAO, presented a classified F-22 report to Congress an unclassified version, along with public testimony, Followed in early 1994 the report assessed the F-15 as superior to projected air threats in four of five performance categories, flight performance, radar, long-range missiles, short-range missiles, and range. Additionally, the report analyzed seven countries, whose air forces represented potential threats to future air superiority missions it concluded that, except for China, each of those air forces possessed between 188 and 460 fighter aircraft, far fewer than the number of U.S. air superiority F-15s in service at that time. Furthermore none of them had more than a handful of advanced fighter aircraft with performance in the F-15s class. Finally, the report predicted that high costs likely would prevent proliferation of these aircraft in 
Short the GAO recognized that the F-22 greatly improved air superiority capabilities but contended that the F-15 could adequately meet air superiority requirements through at least 2014 based on this assessment, it recommended that the Air Force delay IOC for seven years, the service aggressively countered the GAO report, arguing that it underestimated the threat while overestimating the F-15's capabilities. The Air Force's own analysis projected that the F-15 was inferior to the future threat in range and short-range missiles, equal in radar and long-range missiles, and superior only in the flight performance category. Ironically, today's F-22 fails to deliver improved performance in those areas in which the Air Force assessed the F-15 as most efficient range and short-range missiles nonetheless. The service reinforced its F-22 argument with thousands of simulations modeling the F-15. Against the Novo Funktionalny Frontovoy Estrebital, multifunctional frontline fighter, a Soviet developmental project that never entered. Production scenarios pitted two F-15s against eight of these fighters, based on the BUR requirement to fight two major regional conflicts simultaneously. According to Air Force models, the F-22 would establish air superiority in seven days while the F-15 needed 22 to 25 days and only after experiencing 4.8 times the losses in effect, the Air Force had defended the F-22 by using its own assumptions about future threats without addressing the GAO's fundamental allegation the implausibility of the Air Force's threat assumption. Continuing fourth-generation procurement. Only a handful of fourth-generation F-15ES and F-16s were delivered after 1992, serving primarily to keep production lines open for future foreign sales. Although the GAO and members of Congress repeatedly urged the Air Force to consider acquiring additional fourth-generation fighter aircraft, the service has steadfastly concentrated on F-22s and F-35s for the last two decades. By 2012 the results of this fifth-generation fighter acquisition policy had become clear. The Air Force has fielded 187 F-22s while the fighter fleet's average age has simultaneously grown to more than twice the historical average even if additional F-22 production proved feasible, it could not meet greater requirements for fighter recapitalization. First, the F-22's cost, APUC of $191.6 million, virtually guarantees that the service cannot acquire it in sufficient numbers to address the increased need. More importantly, the F-22 is simply too specialized, it cannot execute interdiction, time-sensitive targeting, close air support, or SAD missions as effectively as older fourth-generation aircraft today, the Air Force plans to recapitalize 1,770 aging f 15 s F-16s, and attends entirely via the F-35 program commenting on the F-35 in 2003, Air Force Chief of Staff John Jumper said. I can guarantee you I'm going to make damn sure that we don't fall into some of the early developmental traps that we fell in with the F-A-22 unfortunately, the F-35 has experienced many of the same problems for example, Senator John McCain, Republican Arizona, identified concurrent development, which describes overlap between the development phase and mass production, as the leading cause of the F-35's developmental cost overruns however, concurrency issues were not new a 1995 GAO report highlighted concurrency in the F-22. Program as a major developmental risk massive cost overruns that emerged in 2002 due to unanticipated avionics and structural problems. Validated those concerns today, concurrency issues are the primary reason that F-35 cost overruns have recently accelerated, with projected APUC increasing 17% from $113.6 million to $132.8 million in just one year. The total F-35 cost overruns experienced since EMD began in 2001 now exceed those that occurred in the F-22 program from the start of EMD through the end of production. More importantly, the F-35 is years behind schedule. An Air Force IOC will not occur until at least 2018. Consequently, the service recently announced that it must invest in a service life extension program for the F-16. Finally, further delays and cost overruns are likely the F-35 EMD is years from completion, and Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta recently announced another delay in the F-35's development and acquisition timelines. The feasibility of an all-fifth-generation fighter fleet remains uncertain. The Air Force should not have been surprised by these program cost overruns and schedule delays, given its F-22 experience and the program's similarity to the F-35 that is, both are fifth-generation fighters, both are made by Lockheed Martin, and both plan high levels of concurrent development responding to a question about purchasing updated fourth-generation fighters in 2009 after significant F-35 developmental problems had come to light, Gen. Richard Hawley, retired commander of Air Combat Command, testified that if we had addressed this question 10 or 15 years ago, the answer might be yes however, he had testified 18 years. Earlier that, even upgraded, fourth-generation aircraft could not meet future requirements this appears to confirm that Air Force senior leaders were surprised by the F-35's developmental problems, 
but they probably also viewed additional fourth-generation fighter acquisition as a direct threat to fifth-generation fighter programs regardless, the Air Force failed to implement the only solution that could have eased today's recapitalization problems acquiring additional fourth-generation fighters. The Navy's F-A-18E, F-Super Hornet program ran concurrently with the F-22 unlike the F-22, the F-A-18E, F was not designed to counter any specific threat rather, it addressed shortcomings of the original F-A-18, namely limited range and limited ability to carry unexpended ordnance back to the ship this was a much less ambitious developmental program than the F-22. Lacking stealth, supercruise, or thrust vectoring low developmental risk contributed to completion of the F-A-18E, F very nearly on time, and on budget point 89 as of 2008, the Navy's total program cost amounted to $46.3 billion for 493 F-A-18E, F-S, $93.90, million per jet, while the Air Force's total program cost came to $64.5 billion for 184 F-22s, $350.5 million per jet, in other words, the Navy is buying Super Hornets for the cost of a single F-22 because the Navy did not develop the F-A-18E, F to counter any specific threat. It effectively defended procurement based solely on recapitalization. Needs simply put, old airplanes must be replaced. Although aircraft in the Navy's fighter fleet are an average of seven years younger than those in the Air Force, the Navy is recapitalizing its fleet much more rapidly. The Navy also uses F-A-18E, F acquisition to mitigate continuing F-35 developmental risk with 563 Super Hornets. Currently planned through F-I 2014 and possibly more the Russians and Chinese adopted a similar strategy with the Su-27 fighter. The Su-30 MKK and F-11 combined the basic Su-27 airframe with updated avionics and weapons. These Chinese aircraft represent the most capable potential adversaries for the Air Force, and officials have frequently cited them as justification for additional F-22 production. Conclusion The ATF's overly specialized design constituted a fundamental flaw in the uncertain post-O-Cold War environment the Air Force subsequently missed the best opportunity to adapt the F-22 when it issued the EMD contract without modification to ATF requirements throughout EMD, the service remained overly focused on the F-22 at the expense of a 10, F-15E and F-16 recapitalization when acquisition even tooly shifted to the F-35, the Air Force largely ignored its F-22. Experience and failed to plan for inevitable developmental problems with the F-35 despite massive cost overruns and schedule delays, the Air Force continues to hope that the F-35 can solely recapitalize 1,770 aging F-15Es, F-16s, and attends however, continuing developmental problems and the emerging national fiscal crisis threatened to undermine this strategy. Although stealth is a powerful enabler for offensive systems, its greatest advantage lies in its ability to dramatically increase aircraft survivability against radar-dependent threats consequently, stealth's utility depends on the presence of those threats by insisting on acquiring only stealth fighters, regardless of the cost, the Air Force assumes that future adversaries will not counter stealth technology and ignores the fact that many air combat operations continue to occur in low-threat environments for example, Allied fourth-generation fighters operated freely over large portions of Iraq, both in 1991 and 2003, Serbia, and Libya from the beginning of those conflicts future hostilities likely will continue this long-standing historical trend, and currently fielded stealth assets can mitigate risk to operations in high-threat environments where fourth-generation fighters are most vulnerable. An all-stealth Air Force fighter fleet deserves reconsideration even today stealth technology demands significant trade-offs in range, security, weapons carriage, sortie generation, and adaptability stealth provides no advantage in conflicts such as those in Afghanistan or Iraq. Since 2003, and, despite its obvious utility, it cannot guarantee success in future struggles with a near-peer adversary most importantly, the cost of F-22s and F-35s threatens to reduce the size of the Air Force's fielded fighter fleet to dangerously small numbers. Particularly in the current fiscal environment these facts suggest that the Air Force should reconsider its long-standing position that fifth-generation fighters are the only option for recapitalizing its fighter fleet.